Welcome to Hear the Word of God, the online and broadcast teaching ministry of the Rev. Eric Alexander. Now, the general theme of these chapters from 13 to 23, as I was mentioning last week, is very simply that the God whom Isaiah calls the Holy One of Israel is really the Lord of the nations. He is not just the God of Israel. He is the God of the whole earth. And whereas the gods of the nations, that is of Moab and Philistia and so on, and the gods of Babylon, are gods which are shut up in the confines of these nations, And when the people move out of the nation, they move out, as it were, of the protection of their God. And the God belongs to the nation. He is a national or even a tribal figure. What Isaiah is emphasizing in all these chapters is that the Holy One of Israel is the Lord of the whole earth. His sovereignty extends not just within the boundaries of Israel and Judah, but to the ends of the earth. Now, Isaiah will elaborate that later on in the prophecy, but it's a vital thing to grasp, not only vital for them, with a tendency perhaps to be nationalistic and parochial, but a vital thing for us to discover afresh that the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ is not bound to a Western culture, that He is not limited to a certain group of nations or peoples, but that He is the Lord of the whole earth, and that when He sent His Son into the world, it was with a redeeming purpose that encompasses every tribe and every nation, so that on the day of Pentecost there was a taste of this being given to the early church, in that we hear men speak in all these varied tongues of the wonderful works of God. And the consummation of that, of course, is in the book of Revelation where people from every tribe and every nation are gathered in the presence of the Lamb. Now, it's this same truth that Isaiah is teaching us here in these chapters. And in this particular part of Isaiah, that truth means two things. First of all, it means that because God is the Lord of the nations, He is able to raise up even a heathen nation like Babylon and Assyria and Moab and Egypt and to use them as an instrument or rod in his hand to chastise his people when they turn away from him in rebellion so that in the days that Isaiah was prophesying about in the 6th century B.C., although he prophesied in the 8th century, the people of God knew what it was for Babylon to be used by God as an instrument for their chastening, and they were sent into exile. And God used the Babylonian Empire as a means for chastening and purifying his people so that out of Babylon, ultimately, he brought them a remnant under Ezra and Nehemiah, and they began to rebuild the wastelands of Jerusalem. But it means, first of all, then, that God is able to use these heathen, pagan, foreign nations as instruments of his purpose. The other thing that it means is this, that God's judgments extend 
and his purposes of blessing extend, not just within the bounds of Israel, which is what the people of Israel constantly were tempted to think. You know, they were the ancient equivalent of (coughs) years to us was like us. That was the kind of attitude that you would have found in ancient Israel. And God was seeking to push their horizons back, you see. And it was part of Isaiah's ministry to do precisely that. But it's a very significant thing that God is not morally neutral about these nations he is raising up and using. For example, when he used the Assyrians to scourge and chastise his people, he was not complacent about their wickedness. He was going to come, and in a certain day, he would bring their pride low. And that is what these chapters tell us. One after another, after another, Isaiah is given this prophecy or oracle about Egypt, how God will come and bring moral justice into these nations' histories in the fullness of his time. So there are these two sides of truth that Isaiah is emphasizing. First, that being the God of the whole earth, He is able to raise up and use a heathen nation for his purpose. And secondly, that his purposes of grace and judgment extend beyond the bounds of Israel to every one of these nations. Now, there are three themes which run through these chapters which I want us to draw out and particularly concentrate on as we just comb through them obviously superficially, but uh, I hope in order to stimulate us to read them more ourselves at home. I don't think it would be a wise thing for us to take these chapter by chapter and verse by verse, but rather to see the general conspectus of what it is that Isaiah is saying. First great truth is God is a universal sovereign. That is, he is king over all the earth. Second, God is a universal judge. That is, there is no area of the earth that is outside of his purposes of judgment. Thirdly, God is a universal savior. Now, we need to define that more carefully in a moment, but that's the third truth. God is a universal sovereign, a universal judge, and a universal savior. So there is a doctrinal truth here about God. He is universal sovereign. There is a moral truth about God. He is a universal judge. And there is a missionary truth about God. He is a universal savior. Let's look at the first of these, and you will need to look through with me various parts of this section of the prophecy as we try to understand it together. First, God is a universal sovereign. Now, you find this even in the name by which God is known in this part of Isaiah. At the very beginning, I was mentioning in our introduction to Isaiah that God is known by a title which Isaiah reserves for him, and it's the title, The Holy One of Israel. Now, Israel had been inclined to forget God's holiness in his character and nature, so it's not surprising that at the very beginning of the prophecy, the beginning of Isaiah's career, he encounters God as the one who is thrice holy. And in the temple, Isaiah finds the whole of the created order trembling beneath his feet as he encounters God, whom the cherubim describe as the Holy, Holy, Holy One. And you will know that the Hebrew language multiplies the intensity of something by repeating the name. 
So when Jesus says in Aramaic form, verily, verily, or truly, truly, he is saying, I am emphasizing the importance of this that I'm saying to you. But here Isaiah encounters God, and three times over, for added emphasis, God is described as holy. But do you notice that throughout the whole of these chapters, from 13 to 23, the great name for God is Jehovah, the Almighty. Now, in almost every translation, wherever you find the word Lord with all four letters in capitals, that's the translation of the name Jehovah. And you will notice that here that is coupled with Almighty. Notice it, for instance, in chapters 13 and 14, although the title occurs 20 times throughout these chapters, 13 to 23. 20 times over, God is described as Jehovah Almighty. Chapter 13, verse 4, for instance, Listen a noise on the mountains like that of a great multitude. Listen an uproar among the kingdoms like nations massing together. The Lord Almighty is mustering an army for war. Verse 6, Wail for the day of the Lord. Jehovah is near. It will come like destruction from the Almighty. Verse 13, Therefore I will make the heavens tremble and the earth will shake from its place at the wrath of the Lord Almighty. Then in chapter 14, notice a place where they're all gathered near to each other. In verse 22, I will rise up against them, declares the Lord Almighty. The end of 23, I will sweep her with the broom of destruction, declares the Lord Almighty. Verse 24, the Lord Almighty has sworn. Verse 27, for the Lord Almighty has purposed, and who can thwart him? Now, this universal sovereignty of God is expressed in that name that Isaiah uses for him. And it's the very essence of the message of these chapters. And nowhere is it more clearly crystallized than, than in that passage in chapter 14, verses 24 following, where Isaiah says, "'The Lord Almighty has sworn, "'Surely as I have planned, so it will be, "'and as I have purposed, so it will stand.'" Now, that's an expression of God's absolute sovereignty in everything that he does. He plans, and it will happen. He purposes, and it will stand. Now, you will recognize how different that is from human experience. We make plans, but then we have to say in the end, but my plans came to nothing. I had great plans. Or we may look at circumstances and say, this is not how I planned it. Or we may have a purpose to do something and find it impossible to fulfill. But the distinctive feature of God is that what He plans takes place. What He purposes will stand. And so He says in verse um, 26, this is the plan determined for the whole world. This is the hand stretched out over all nations, for the Lord Almighty has purposed, and who can thwart him? His hand is stretched out, and who can turn it back? Now, you could not find anywhere in Scripture a clearer or stronger view of God's absolute sovereignty than that. Now, if we ask of these chapters, how does God exercise his sovereignty? The answer that Isaiah gives to us is in two parts. One, 
as we have just read in 1424, he plans in his mind. And two, interestingly, you find an example of it in chapter 16, verse 13, in the oracle against Moab, 1613, he speaks with his mouth. Now, what Isaiah is saying, you see, is God plans in his mind with his perfect wisdom. He plans and purposes his will for the world and for men and nations and for individuals like ourselves. And then the next stage in his outworking of that is he speaks. Notice chapter 16, verse 13. This is the word the Lord has already spoken concerning Moab. But now the Lord says, within three years as a servant bound by contract would count them, Moab's splendor and all her many people will be despised, and her survivors will be very few and feeble. Another illustration of the same principle is in chapter 23, in verse 9, the prophecy about Tyre, that nation that is at the very uh, eastern end of the Mediterranean, part of the Phoenician Empire. Chapter 23, verse 9, the Lord Almighty planned it. Now, how does God put his plans into action? Notice in verse 11, the Lord has stretched out his hand over the sea and made its kingdoms tremble. He has given an order concerning Phoenicia that our fortresses be destroyed. He said, no more of your reveling. Now, that is the picture that we get from the very beginning of the Bible, you see, of the God who planned in his mind and then speaks. How did God create the heavens and the earth. He did not have to assemble a multitude of workers. What he did was this. He said, let there be light. And there was light. He said, and it was. Because God's sovereignty is exercised simply in his speaking a word. And the nations of the world are at his disposal, as it were, when he commands and it is done. Now, because we are God's finite creatures in all our own weakness and limitation, that's something that blows our understanding. We can scarcely grasp it. But it is this kind of God that we are dealing with day by day as he brings us to know him. A God who has planned in his mind and Isaiah says, who can thwart him? And then he speaks with his mouth and says, let it be so. And it is. This is the God who is universally sovereign in creation, in redemption, in providence, and in judgment. And what he says is done now. That does not mean that we shall understand his sovereign ways. Otherwise, we would be gods and not men and women. And Isaiah has something to say about that if you just look a bit further on in chapter 55 at verse 8. The Lord is declaring something which is immensely important for us to put alongside our understanding of his sovereignty. And here it is, Isaiah 55 verse 8, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, 
So are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now, that is how we relate to God's sovereignty, you see. We relate to His sovereign power in two ways. First, by trusting Him absolutely. Whom else shall we trust? Isaiah is constantly pressing this upon them. It is, in a sense, the great message of Isaiah. Trust in the Lord. Do not put your confidence in men. Trust in the Lord. And that's the first way we relate to His sovereignty. The second way we relate to His sovereignty is by saying, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are your ways higher than my ways, and your thoughts than my thoughts. I will trust in the Lord and not be afraid, but I may not understand the first thing about what God is doing, but I will trust Him, knowing that one day He will make it clear. So there is the first great truth that Isaiah teaches us in these chapters. He is universal sovereign. We may find more briefly uh, the second of these great truths. He is universal judge. I hope you're hearing me at the very back, are you? Not being blasted out of the room by the loudspeaker system, but I'm determined to beat that chap outside there. It's the last thing I do, which it may well be, but... Uh, Turn back to Isaiah 13 then, verse 19. Isaiah 13, 19. God is the universal judge as well as the universal sovereign. In verse 19, Babylon, the jewel of kingdoms, the glory of the Babylonians' pride, will be overthrown by God just as he overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. And then he begins to describe, and we read this last week, how Babylon is going to be deserted. Only the jackals and the owls and the hyenas will be there in all the luxurious palaces that were once Babylon, and it has become true. But Babylon, which was God's instrument to chastise his people, will be brought under his universal judgment. Chapter 17, verses 1 to 3, Damascus. Now, Syria has been the means also of God's instruments in bringing discipline upon His people, but He is going to judge Damascus or Syria for its evil Verse 1 of chapter 17, an oracle concerning Damascus. See, Damascus will no longer be a city, but will become a heap of ruins. The cities of Aroer will be deserted and left to flocks which will lie down with no one to make them afraid. The fortified city will disappear from Ephraim and royal power from Damascus. The remnant of Aram, which is the word for Syria, will be like the glory of the Israelites, declares the Lord. And God's judgment is going to fall upon Damascus. Similarly, in chapter 19, upon Egypt. An oracle concerning Egypt. See, the Lord rides on a swift cloud and is coming to Egypt. The idols of Egypt tremble before him, and the hearts of the Egyptians melt within them. And God is going to create a situation in Egypt of civil war, as we read in our reading, which is going to be his judgment upon this nation. But then notice uh, how that judgment becomes personal. For example, in chapter 22, it is not just a judgment upon nations, it is a judgment upon individuals. And here is God speaking to Jerusalem, and this is the one case where he is coming back home, as it were, to speak to his own people. Um, verse 15, this is what the Lord, the Lord Almighty says. Now here is God in universal judgment. Go say to this steward, 
to Shebna, who is in charge of the palace. What are you doing here, and who gave you permission to cut out a grave for yourself here, hewing your grave on the height and chiseling your resting place in the rock? Now, Shevna appears to have been a steward who had lived corruptly. He had corrupted the power that was lodged in him and clearly thought that he had got away with it. He had purloined other people's resources. He had carved out a life of luxury for himself, and it was symbolized in this distinguished, luxurious grave of all things that he had carved out for himself on the heights. Now notice verse 17. Beware the Lord is about to take firm hold of you and hurl you away, O you mighty man. He will roll you up tightly like a ball and throw you into a large country. There you will die and there your splendid chariots will remain. You disgrace to your master's house. I will depose you from your office, and you will be ousted from your position. Here is God, you see, the universal judge of the earth, dealing with these great nations whom he is going to bring down from their pride, and now he touches upon one isolated individual. Strangely enough, I happened to pick up to check something a book from my shelves by Professor Donald Wiseman just this afternoon called Illustrations from Biblical Archaeology. Some of you may have it. And I discovered this tomb pictured here, a hole in a very high rock. And the legend underneath reads, the lintel of a tomb prepared for Shevna, a royal steward called he who is over the house. The name Shevna is found on several Palestinian seals, but this tomb was conspicuously set in a necropolis occupied by those of high rank. And the text, the third longest monumental inscription in archaic Hebrew, supports the opinion that this is the tomb of the Shevna judged by God in Isaiah 22, 15 to 16. And here it is. Very significant. Here is God's judgment working out in archaeological discovery. And throughout the whole of this section, you read it in places, for example, like the judgment against Babylon, where God is bringing the pride of Babylon down and taking these nations which had vaunted themselves against God and humbling them before their neighbors. And it is a God of universal judgment that you see. Third and last thing, He is here as a universal Savior. Now, what that means in this part of Isaiah is not that God is the Savior of all men and women indiscriminately and without exception. Rather, it means that He is the Savior of all who come to Him without distinction, particularly distinction of nationality, or race, or privilege. The salvation of God in the Bible is from the beginning a cross-cultural, international, universal gospel. And this is what Isaiah is proclaiming to us in this particular section. You discover God not only coming in judgment upon a nation, but weeping over them. 
you discover him not only bringing judgment upon Damascus, for example, in chapter 17, but in verses 7 and 8, saying, In that day, that is the day of grace, the day of the Messiah, men will look to their Maker and turn their eyes to the Holy One of Israel. They will not look to the altars, the work of their hands. They will have no regard for the Asherah poles and the incense altars. They will rather look to the Holy One of Israel. That's Damascus in Syria, a pagan nation. And God looks to the day when they will turn to the Holy One of Israel. Look at the next chapter, chapter 18. Now, it's very interesting that this is Cush, which, as I was saying, is translated in some versions Ethiopia, but not the Ethiopia that we know today. It's further south, the Sudan. Now, if you know anything about the Sudan and know the picture of the Sudanese people, they are these people with an extraordinary poise and height. They are tall people. They are people of great dignity, known as a smooth-skinned people. Now look at chapter 18, verse 1. Woe to the land of whirring wings along the rivers of Cush. There's another interesting thing, so many interesting things. Another very interesting thing, though. The land of the whirring wings, the Hebrew for whirring wings, is almost identical to tsetse. You know? The whirring wings, the tsetse. Now, what's the tsetse fly? It's the whirring wings of this particularly unpleasant insect which could devastate an area. Woe to the land of whirring wings along the rivers of Cush, which sends envoys by sea and papyrus boats over the water, which has been discovered to be true in the last 50 years. Go, swift messengers, listen, to a people tall and smooth-skinned, to a people feared far and wide because the Sudanese were great warriors an aggressive nation of strange speech whose land is divided by rivers. That was probably a certain part of the Nile. Notice verse 7. At that time, gifts will be brought to the Lord Almighty from a people tall and smooth-skinned, from a people feared far and wide, an aggressive nation of strange speech whose land is divided by rivers, the gifts will be brought to Mount Zion, the place of the name of the Lord Almighty. Now, some people think that one fulfillment of that was the eunuch who came up to Jerusalem to seek and worship God who was met by Philip on the road to Gaza. And you will remember how Philip found him reading Isaiah 53. And he said to Philip, of whom does the prophet speak? And Philip began at that chapter and preached unto him Jesus. Now, we don't know whether that Ethiopia was this Ethiopia or not. But it is a glorious thing to see this promise, promise for the Sudanese people that they will bring gifts to the Almighty and worship Him. Egyptians, in verse 19, doing the same. Did you notice that in our reading in verse 19? In that day there will be an altar to the Lord in the heart of Egypt. Now, uh, some relate this to the temple built in Egypt by the Jewish high priest Onias IV, who fled to Egypt in the second century B.C., but the reference appears to be to the occasion when there was a great ingathering of Egyptians into the kingdom of God through the gospel of Christ. 
a monument to the Lord at its border. It will be a sign and witness to the Lord Almighty in the land of Egypt. When they cry out to the Lord because of their oppressors, He will send them a Savior and Defender, and He will rescue them. So the Lord will make Himself known to the Egyptians. And in that day they will acknowledge the Lord. They will worship. Now that's a very wonderful thing. But it is true, you see, that today, even today, if you go to Egypt, and I've never been to Egypt, but I've met people from Egypt, some of the godliest, most spiritually minded Presbyterians from Alexandria in Egypt. And there is the knowledge of the Lord in the heart of that nation. But I think God is speaking here of something infinitely greater than that. But do you see how our missionary vision can be extended and enlarged by this, the sovereign Lord who is sovereign over the whole earth, and sovereign in judgment is also sovereign in grace. There is a missionary truth here about God. He means to gather His people in from every nation. We're finished, but just turn over to Isaiah 43, will you? And you will see God repeating the same thing. These are the sort of things that make it odd that they will insist that there's a different author for this part of Isaiah. He certainly must have known the other one extremely well. Verse 3, For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt for your ransom, Cush and Seba in your stead, since you are precious and honored in my sight. And because I love you, I will give men in exchange for you and people in exchange for your life. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bring your children from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up and to the south. Do not hold back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth, everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Now, I don't think that simply refers to the Jewish nation spread throughout the world. It refers to God's people, to the ends of the earth. Bring them, says God. I will gather them from the ends of the earth. And because he is a God of such sovereign power, we need not have the slightest doubt that he will do precisely that. Let's pray together. Father, we bless you for your sovereign glory. We thank you for the summons you have given us to trust you afresh and for the knowledge that you are the living God, and beside you there is no Savior. Oh, help us that we may trust you and you alone, and that our vision may be raised to the ends of the earth as we look to you to call your people to yourself. For Christ our Savior's sake. Amen. You're listening to Hear the Word of God with the Rev. Eric Alexander, a minister in the Church of Scotland for over 50 years. To access more Bible teaching from Rev. Alexander, visit hearthewordofgod.org, where your generous contribution will help us sustain and grow this ministry. That's hearthewordofgod.org. You could choose instead to mail a check to this address, 600 Eden Road, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, 17601, or call 1-800-488-1888. This program is a presentation of the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals. I'm Mark Daniels. Thank you for listening. Please join us again next time for Eric Alexander and Hear the Word of God.